So far, I've demonstrated how it's going to kill you if you do online data maintenance, how it's going to kill you if you do truncate and direct load insert. What have we achieved? Online data loading. Perhaps not a good title there because I would imagine all data loading is online, but the description will perhaps help us out here. We have a large 100 million row table and we modify millions of rows of this every day. They, there's more detail obviously behind that's provided here, but they were literally updating almost half the rows every single day. During this update, queries to this table are incredibly slow or they time out. So they tried an alternative, which was rather than update millions of rows, they truncated and reloaded the table. But obviously the moment you truncate the table, everyone's queries start going horribly wrong. They're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. What are some of the options? I've mentioned in a previous videos dealing of what we call the, the cost of undoing data to get a read consistent view. Uh, that's possibly what this customer was encountering. It could have just been their server was overwhelmed. Either way, we're looking for mechanisms by which we can reduce the load and, and get a better result here for our customer. So let's use an entirely demo based system to describe this problem. And we'll walk through what the problem is and, and recreate that. And then we'll walk through maybe some potential solutions. My 100 million row table is going to be only a copy of DBA objects. It's going to be big enough for our needs. It's only about 80,000 rows, but that will be fine. I'm putting an index on the owner column just to mimic you know, a typical environment where we have various subordinate objects sitting behind a table. I'm going to simulate now what happens when you do large data maintenance while people are actively querying the table. Now, rather than have 25 windows on the screen and you getting lost and more importantly, me getting lost, I'll do it in the same session by opening up some ref cursors. So here I'm opening up a ref cursor, select count status from the table called T. I can print that out. This query has been open and it's been run. So this is the perfect scenario where there's no data maintenance going on. And we can see what it costs to run that particular query. It is what, 13,000, I think that's microseconds. So 13 milliseconds of CPU time. And we did 1,333 buffer gets. Let's open another ref cursor now. It's actually the exact same query. And now we'll throw some data maintenance concurrently going on at the same time. So here's my data maintenance. It's just a PL SQL block. We're updating the object ID, updating the owner, updating the created, just changing or touching, in this case, every single row in the table. However, we opened that ref cursor before this data maintenance went on, simulating an actively running query while we do data maintenance. And therefore, when we actually fetch from this cursor, we actually had to provide a read consistent view and undo all those changes. So the result still comes out the same, still 52,000 rows. But instead of 13 milliseconds of CPU, now it's 42 milliseconds of CPU. For a tiny table, that difference is obviously negligible, but it, in terms of magnitude, that's a three times degradation. We've gone from 30, 13 to 42 milliseconds. It's three times more expensive. And instead of 1,300 buffer gets, we've now got 55,000 buffer gets. You can start to see the very rapid escalation in costs in running queries while you're doing large data maintenance activities. So this is quite possibly the cause that this customer was having all these problems in terms of their queries either slowing down or timing out. They just have to do that much more work. And now we're going to simulate the other thing this customer tried. That is, what happens if we just truncate and reload the data and therefore avoid all that costs of dynamically changing lots of rows? They're generally very inefficient things in terms of redo and undo. I open up the cursor, I truncate the table, and therefore I reload the table. This is the direct path mechanism to reduce the window during which data maintenance occurs. We make the data maintenance operations faster. Therefore, the chances of queries being in this window are much lower. But because I've opened a ref cursor, we actually do have one in this window. Now when I'm trying to do a query, I get object no longer exists. And that's what a truncate has done. A truncate literally rips a segment out from the data file, so to speak, and simply blows it away. 
it doesn't really have to do anything, but that literally that object is gone. When you truncate a segment, that segment's thrown away. When it's repopulated, you actually get a brand new segment. It has a brand new data object ID in user objects. So when I tried to fetch from this curse, which was opened, it says, what you're trying to fetch from no longer exists. And this is the other problem that they were having. Aura 8103 normally means you're moving a segment around while queries are trying to access it. The most common ones are obviously truncate, drop, and also things like exchange partition, things along those lines where things are being shuffled around and queries can't complete successfully. So what are we gonna do? So far I've demonstrated how it's gonna kill you if you do online data maintenance, how it's gonna kill you if you do truncate and direct load insert. What have we achieved? Let's look at options we can now explore to improve upon this. So I'm gonna recreate, I'm gonna create a new table called T1. It's just the same as T, it's a brand new copy of DBA objects with the same index. Now I'm gonna create a view on top of T1. I'm gonna call it user data. And this is the thing that I'm going to give to my user community. This is the object they're going to be able to query. They're never going to see T1. I would have that in a different schema. They wouldn't get grants on it. They have to access the data through view user data. I'm gonna open up a cursor as before. So this is a simulation of our actively running query. It's already been opened. Now, rather than go and do data maintenance against table T1, where people are actively querying it, I'm gonna create a copy of T1, in this case, it's table T2, and do the data maintenance on that one. In this case, I've just done a very, very simple one. Um, I've set the status column to null. So that query doing count status would actually return zero if I queried T2. I'm gonna put an index on T2 so it looks exactly the same as T1. And now I'm going to replace my view. Now this is interesting because I have an open active query querying the user data view when it used to be defined as select star from T1. And I've just come along now and just ripped the guts out of that and pointed it to T2. Let's see what happens. I print out that ref cursor, which simply said, which was originally when it was opened, was pointing to table T1. And guess what? It works fine. The reason it works fine is I've done nothing to T1. I haven't truncated it. I haven't changed anything about it. It's nice and snappy and efficient because T1 is unchanged by this operation. It was T2, which was a copy of T1, which has done all the heavy lifting. If I now open that same ref cursor, but obviously now after the data maintenance has occurred and the view has been pointed elsewhere back to T2. Now when I open up a ref cursor and print it out, I get the result now that I've done my data maintenance. Remember I set the status to null, which means count of status would return a count of zero. But notice that at no time did any errors occur. No one got object no longer exist and there was no huge under required because queries that were in flight were accessing T1 and queries that basically came along after the data maintenance had no idea that they were now pointing at a brand new copy of the table, T2. Obviously, this can only really be done if you have either a read-only or very nearly read-only copy of the table, if it's basically in a data warehouse or something, which is probably pretty common if you're doing massive amounts of data changes. It's pretty rare in a transactional environment that you would go update 50 million rows, but we'll come to that. But you can see here that this is a cool idea where you actually leave the original data in place, you clone and change the data, and then simply change the view to point to it. The reason even if you had an online transaction environment that needed to do this and you had some way of tracking the changes between table T1 whilst you're maintaining table T2, et cetera, one of the issues with doing this in a high volume transaction environment would be the fact that I effectively ran this table and then dynamically changed the view means cursors get flushed out of the shared pool or get marked invalid. So the two queries I had there were basically a count status C1, that was the first ref cursor I opened against T1, and count status C2. And that was the second ref cursor I opened up against after the data maintenance has been finished. I can only see one of them in the library cache. That's a bit strange, isn't it? And the reason is the first one has been chucked away because it's invalid the moment I redirected that view definition. To see that data, I need to go look in VDLS SQL stats, which has a larger retention period. 
And we see actually what's actually gone on here. This was the query that opened up against user data when it pointed at T1. The moment I recreated the view, that cursor got marked invalid. So effectively, I can no longer use it. Therefore, I had to reparse. In fact, I would have had to reparse even if I used the same query. I used a different column alias so we could see the difference. This one doesn't have any invalidations yet. The next time I do data maintenance, I would copy T2 back to T1. And then I'd do the maintenance in T1 and then flick the, the view backwards that way. But once again, you can see doing these things where we dynamically change the view definition results in cursor invalidations. And they're generally a bad thing in an OLTP environment because what you don't want is lots of parsing overheads going on. I've spoken many times before on previous videos about the costs of parsing. So for a data warehouse, this is a perfectly adequate solution. It's generally going to be fairly read-only data. Parsing costs are negligible in a data warehouse because you don't have a high volume of queries. But if we are in a transactional environment, can we avoid even the parsing overhead? Yes, we can. I'm going to create a context first. A context is just like a little in-memory data store. To set a context variable, you need to bind it to some sort of PL SQL package. So I'll do that now. I've got a package called PKG, and all it does is set a variable. And the package body simply does dbms session set context, the name of my context, some particular key, and then some particular value. It's only got one key. I'm just going to call it the version. And version sort of suggests actually what I'm going to do here with my data. Rather than have a view that I have to change the definition for, I'm going to create a view that has a constant definition. It's user data where it gets all the data from T1 only if my version from my context variable is one. Um, I'm using actually a string here because context variables are always characters. So even though I'm using version one, it's actually a string. Then from select from T2, if the version is two. So my view always accesses actually both tables. Let's set the version to one and run a query. And I get the original version of T1, the unchanged status values. If I set the version to two, then I get the second query effectively, both from user data, but I get no values of status because they've all been set to null. So simply by toggling the value of this context, which can be a global context, as we show in the definition, which means everyone sees the same value, I can now flick effectively what side of the union all people are seeing without having to change the view data itself. If I go look now in validations, I can see this is the query I ran now, which is C3. It's the latest of the queries, and there are no invalidations, even though I flicked the version over from one to two. It's one copy of the cursor in memory. It hasn't been invalidated, and yet I can toggle which data people see, the pre or post data maintenance. That's all well and good. It sounds fantastic, but I've now got a view which is accessing both tables, correct? Which means the cost of reading that table is probably going to be double. Let's explore that. Here's the execution plan for, let me pause up a bit, select count status from user data where owner equals sys. It looks like this. It looks like we're accessing both tables because we have, I'm accessing T1 and I'm accessing T2 as well. But the key thing here is the filter lines, four and seven. If we go look at the notes to see what actually is going on there, we're doing sys context vericles one and sys context vericles two. So the first thing before I even think about accessing T1 is I check the context. If the context isn't one, I simply bypass this entire chunk of the execution plan. So I won't even touch T1. If the version is two, I'll only access this part. Even though both tables are listed in there, we will only ever query one half of the union all. You might be a little bit cynical of that. You know, an execution plan is a little bit more than you know, just you know, not guarantee that this is actually what's going to happen. So let's do this. My current version is two. I'm going to move table T1 to a table space called demo and take that table space offline. So now T1 is by definition inaccessible. It can't be accessed. Yet what happens now? What if I try run my user data view, which accesses T1 and T2? That's fine. The version is set to two. We don't even look at the T1 reference. We only access the T2 part. Wrapping all that into too long, didn't read. One is you've got to be, be aware if you're using any kind of truncate or drop commands to do data maintenance of Aura 8103. And the reason I say beware is 
Sometimes you won't see them. They are, can be sporadic. If the segment happens to be left in place, then sometimes, in particular, like if you drop a petition, often a query can still run off that petition, even though it's been dropped or exchanged. Oracle can be pretty smart that way. Therefore, these become sporadic, which is probably even worse. Using the view concept where you dynamically change the definition of the view is probably going to be fine for data warehouses because we don't really care about the parsing costs and the volume of query uh, transactions is fairly low. But if you're in a high activity environment, then yeah, look at using a context or a table for OOTP. And I totally concede here, I've very much glossed over the fact that if you are going to have two copies of the data, you might need some mechanism to keep them in sync during the maintenance. Um, just something to be worthy of note. But yeah, I, I believe that for as a reader exercise. Mm -hmm.